So uh, in this talk, S, S will be a K3 surface, smooth projective. And for a coherent sheaf F on S, uh, the Mukai vector B of F, which is by definition trend character F times the square root of the Todd class of S, which is equal to the rank of F and C1 of F and then some C2 plus R. This encodes the numerical invariance. Um, so if we pick an ample line bundle, then we have the notion of H stable sheaves, or semi-stable sheaves, uh, according to Giesecker. And so we, can, we let M be H be the moduli space of H semi-stable sheaves on S with this, uh, with some fixed Mukai vector. So um, it's a very famous and important result of Mukai that if F is stable, then the Mukai, uh, the moduli space MVH is smooth at F with tangent space X1 FF. And moreover, there exists a sigma, a holomorphic symplectic form. On the stable locus of M. And this homomorphic symplectic form is because the tangent space of the points here is given by the uh, x1, this is induced by the cup product x1 times x1 in x2, which by sur duality and, and the fact that this, this by sur duality and the fact we're in a k3, this is hom ff. And this is just uh, one dimensional. So this is a holomorphic symplectic form on the stable locus. So if so if the moduli space coincides with the stable locus, then this guy is a, a smooth projective hypercalar manifold. And um, in general, though, we have a strict inequality here. And the singularities um, of this moduli space lie in the locus of strictly semi-stable sheaves. So to understand the singularities of these moduli spaces, we have to understand these loci. In particular, we ha have to understand when these strictly semi-stable semi sheaves exist. So there are essentially two sources of these guys. Um, so the first is, is the Mukai vector is not primitive. So if we pick um, a multiple, a positive multiple of a Mukai vector, this corresponds, for example, if, if we're doing uh, moduli space of sheaves on, of vector bundles on a curve to the fact when the rank and the degree are not co-prime. And this uh, case was studied by O'Grady and by um, finding a symplectic resolution of the singularities in two specific cases, he found two new examples. of hypercalar manifolds that are not deformation equivalent to uh, the previous known examples. And, uh, and then after Kieran, uh, these moduli spaces were studied by Kaledin, Len, and Serger. 
and who showed that, who considered the other cases that uh, Kieran hadn't considered, and they showed in, and they're considering them to see if they could, uh, if these singular moduli spaces admitted a symplectic resolution, but uh, they showed that in all the other examples, other cases, other, um, other than those considered by Gretti, um, there is no symplectic resolution. So uh, in some sense, orthogonally to this case is the case when the Mukai vector V is primitive, but um, we choose a very a specific polarization. So H is not done. So in, in this talk, I'll be uh, concerned with studying this case. And I should say this is uh, joint work with Enrico Arbarello. Um, so we'll see in these cases that there are natural symplectic resolutions. But even though the resolution themselves don't give new examples because they're just the deformation equivalent to the Hilbert scheme of points on a K3 surface, uh, the resolution itself is interesting and it's related to the irrational geometry of these moduli spaces. And so the, the aim of this talk is to give a local structure of these, these resolutions that arise in these cases. So for now on, we'll, we'll focus on the case for, so it's a technical reason, so I'll say in a moment why we restrict to this case, uh, to uh, rank zero sheaves. So a sheaf is said to be pure of dimension one. No, it's not canonical, so for any choice of of a polarization, I'll be I'll be more precise in a moment, and the and the uh, and the resolution are related by wall crossing by rational maps, but for any each of these, yeah 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 yeah. So any for any each of these resolutions, we find the local model and yeah. So f pure of dimension one. Um, if the support of f has dimension one. And the same is true for any subsheaf of F. So essentially, all subsheafs of F have dimension one support. There's no embedded uh, skyscraper sheets in F. Um, so if this is the case, the Mukai vector of F is of the form zero, C1, and the Euler characteristic. Um, so when, when, when considering these sheaves, the Giesecker stability Uh, re with respect to some ample H amounts to considering the slope stability of F with respect to the, the slope C1 of F times H. So just if you translate what um, Giesecker stability means with respect to the reduced Hilbert uh, polynomial, this is what it means. So uh, uh, the sort of typical example of pure dimension sheaf, one sheaf on a, on a surface is the following. If J, if J is the inclusion of the curve uh, in S and L is any, say, torsion-free sheaf on, on C, rank one, or line bundle, whatever, uh, the sheaf F is pure of dimension one. So I don't ask uh, that F does not have torsion because if C had several components, there would be torsion. But all the torsion is supported on one-dimensional um, supports. Um, so in particular, uh, from this we see that if C is integral and F of this form is, has rank one on C, then F is stable with respect to any H. So 
So more interesting things happen if when this is not true. And uh, for example, if I have a union of two curves and f is, say, a line bundle on the union of these two curves, then um, one can check that if I, so, um, so the stability, of course, I can check on subsheaves or also quotient sheaves. So it's enough to check on these, whoops, on these uh, quotient sheaves that are f restricted to ci. So I only need to check that the Euler characteristic of f over c times h is smaller or smaller or equal if I ask for semi-stability to the Euler characteristic of these restrictions times c h. Dot h. So if if I'm uh, if I have uh, ample H in the ample cone of S and say F is H stable so it means that this holds for I equals to 1 and 2 so I can think of degenerating H to some locus where say for I equals to 1 we have equality so the sheaf that earlier was H stable becomes H0, if I call this the generation H0, semi-stable. And in fact, if I have this map F to FC1, and I denote the kernel FC2, this is exactly the Jordan-Holder filtration, the Jordan filtration of this H0 semi-stable sheaves. Because these two guys just reported on irreducible curves, so they're stable with respect to any polarization, in particular with respect to H0. So basically what happens here is that there's like a co-dimension one linear subspace inside the ample cone where there exist strictly semi-stable sheaves. So walls in the ample cone by definition, are the loci where there exist strictly semi-stable sheaves. And a chamber will be the, the complement of the union of the walls. So, for example, here and here. So, Yoshioka uh, showed that in this pure dimension one case, there exists a finite union, the walls correspond to a finite union of real co-dimension one subspaces. And on each wall, but away from intersection with the other wall, the moduli space is constant. Oh, let me draw a picture. We have these walls. So in the, in the chambers, um, stability and semi-stability are the same, so the moduli spaces are smooth projective hypercalibre manifolds, and on each walls there are going to be some singularities, but on each wall, uh, if I am away from the, the, where the wall intersects the other walls, the moduli space is constant. So here I had uh, F that was stable here, and I degenerate to a wall, and it was H semi-stable. So in particular, this gives me a map from a moduli space, say on a chamber, to the moduli space on a wall. I am call this map H. And in fact, it's a lemma for a that this map always exists in the pure dimension one case. It's an easy remark. It's basically what I wrote earlier, so that if I have a sheaf F, I associate the sheaf F. But so first, if, 
if the on the stable locus, so the stable locus corresponds to isomorphism classes of sheaves. But where I have strictly semi-stable sheaves, the moduli space is not uh, um, the, the points, the closed points of the moduli space don't correspond to isomorphism classes of sheaves, but to the so-called S H0 equivalence classes. Yeah, so because this doesn't, in general, this is only like this. Because when you have two, so because so the, the Hilbert polynomial of a pure dimension one sheaf has rank one, so there are only two coefficients. And then you divide by the leading one, and so you only have one thing to check. When you have two things, it could be that it's stable because the first, you have to compare two things. The first is the same, but the second maybe might, might you know, screw it up. So then when, when you degenerate. So yeah, actually I was going to say that next. In, uh, for higher rank sheaves, the right notion is that of bridge instability. So what, whatever we're doing now is only done for this case, but the next generalization of, of the project is like the natural extension to that. So whatever uh, thing we're going to say now, what we can't say for the moment for those objects is just a local deformation theory of bridge and stable objects. So that's, uh, but yeah, that's the, uh, yeah. So, um, so what does it mean to sheaves F and F prime are SH0 equivalent to semi-stable, to H0 semi-stable sheaves are uh, equivalent, so they correspond to the same point here, if and only if I consider their, their jordan holdel filtration and the associated graded are the same. So of course these, these objects depend on H0. So in, for example, in this case, if I have a sheaf here that is of the form F1 plus F2, what is the fiber F inverse of F1 off F2? This is, will be the projectivization of the set of the extensions F1, F, F2. And so an important, it's a trivial remark, but it's, it's going to be important in, in the following, is that whenever you go on one side of the wall, the slope of this guy will be bigger or smaller than the slope of this guy. So on one side of the wall, I'll have extensions F1, F, F2. On the other side of the wall, I'll have extension F2, F, F1. And so if I... Um, just write it here. So if I'm on one side of the wall, I'll say I'll call it H plus, M H zero, and at H minus, this is the birational map, the wall crossing birational map. And because this is P X one F one F two, this birational map is just the Mukai flop that replaces a projective space with its dual. Because on a K3 surface, X1, F1, F2 is sur dual to X1, F2, F1. Uh, so in general, things are more complicated, but uh, so uh, the, yeah, but that's a sort of general picture. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a bit by, about equivalent varieties uh, because we'll use these guys to find this local model. So what is a what is a quiver? Um, so abstractly, they're isomorphic because there are two projective spaces of the same dimension.
Well, in general, what you're going to have is going to have, instead of extensions, like tower of extensions and stuff like that. So I, I think that um, I think that, yes, that, that should be. So, so wait, wait, wait. Um, when, if I go out on a chamber, yes. Because say I have something here, I could also go out here. So if I have MH, MH1, MH0, I have maps like this. So the maps, the, the fibers of these maps could vary. But I think the fiber from this, abstractly, they're just the same. Well, OK, yeah. So um, the two things are k-equivalent. So. Uh, I mean, they're they're also deformation equivalent. So 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 they are they're the same, yeah. Um, but apart from the isomorphism induced by on cohomology by the fact that they're deformationally equivalent, there should be also an equivalence of the derived category, and that's a more complicated thing. Uh, but for example, so there's been a lot of work about these kind of diagrams for Nakajima quiver varieties, and including Kautis proved some, some cases of this uh, k-equivalent implies d-equivalent. And so maybe one can use this comparison thing that I'm going to talk about today to like kind of use those results in the presentation theory to deduce these for these kind of moduli spaces. Um, but, um, Yeah. But I mean, independently of the fact that they're more complicated, I think that like abstractly, if you change chamber, you're not going to change uh, Oh, no, 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 sure. Absolutely. No, 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 no. Absolutely. 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 But I mean, wh whatever the fibers are, it depends on. So over. In general, you'll have a direct sum of stuff. And so what the form of the fiber will be kind of towers of extension of these forms. And if you go on one side, you'll have, you know, you just change the order, the order of the factors here. And so numerically, what will, what will happen just depends on, like, the dimension of the axe groups of these sheaves. So I don't know. Yeah. Some some uh, cases uh, are. Yeah, yeah. Some some ca some of these are generalized uh, stratified Mukai plot. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So. Mm -hmm. In that case it's it's trivially true because you're yeah, you just have but um, So uh, a quiver is just uh, an oriented graph. Um, so I'll denote by i from 1 to s, the set of vertices, and by e, the set of edges. So for example, 1, 2, and I allow uh, loops at the edges. Actually, it will turn out to be important in, in the case. And uh, so given a quiver Q, I can fix a dimension vector. Um, so that will be just a set of n1 through ns, positive integers. So this just means that I'm fixing a, I can fix a, 
vector space of dimension n i at the two ver at the each vertices vertex. Um, so, given this data, I can define the set of representations of Q with dimension vector n, and this is just sum over the edges of the hum vi vj, where i is the source of the edge and j is the target of the, of the edge. So I'm just saying that if I have a verte uh, an edge going from vi to vj, I have the set of linear maps from vi to vj. And of course, if I set gn, the product of the gl and i, this group acts by conjugation here. Um, so we won't be considering this. So given equivalent q, what we need to do to get some symplectic structure is pass from q to q bar, which is a quiver with the same um, set of vertices, same i, but uh, I add a uh, edge with opposite orientation. But for each edge, I add an edge with opposite orientation. So in this example here, I have one, two, this. So for this arrow here, I add one in the opposite direction and also here. You, you still you still you, you still add one yeah you could be yeah many yeah so you don't really uh, no and in fact once you double thing it the structure everything won't depend on the orientation of the original quiver so as long as there's for each arrow in one direction, there's another in the arrow in the other direction. You don't, you don't care. So in fact, the, the, the point of doubling is that the representations of Q bar n are naturally a direct sum of the representation of Q n plus the representations of the, the quiver with the opposite orientation n. And this, because I, whenever I have a map from the i, v, j here, I have um, v, j, v, i, these two spaces are naturally dual to each other. So this is just the dual of this guy here. So the vector, sp this space of linear maps has a natural symplectic form. Given by the trace pairing. And the action of this group here preserves the symplectic structure. So um, and of course, the center of this group acts true. Or the product of the centers. No, sorry. This is right. So under these circumstances, there is the so-called moment map. Which takes value in the dual Lie algebra. And uh, it has a form if I have an element here and an element there, this has the form of mu x, y. So 
I mean, the, the important things about this map is just that it's a GN equivariant map with respect to the natural action here and the co-adjoint action here. It's a quadratic map as And there is something called symplectic reduction. Which I'll say what it is in a moment, but allows us to put a symplectic form on the quotient. So um, I can consider the zero locus of the moment map and take the affine quotient by this group G. And this is what I'll call M0. So 0 is because I'm just taking the naive uh, uh, spec and the invariant quotient. And um, so because of the symplectic reduction, the smooth locus here, so this guy here, or at least the smooth locus of this guy, inherits a symplectic form. So this is what will be the local model from MH. And I'll say in a moment some natural desingularization of these guys that will play the role of this MH. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but if if the Mukai vector is primitive, no, then okay. yeah, the yeah. So, just uh, so. okay. What I mean, I I just mean that. Um, so if I take the locus here uh, that have no endomorphism, then this is smooth. Actually, it's a regular locus. And for a point here, the normal space to the orbit of this point has a natural symplectic form. This is only what I mean. So I have the quotient map to this thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's a maybe symplectic, a holomorphic version of the standard. Yeah. Okay, so this is just a, a fine spec and the invariant quotient. So the orbits, the points on this guy are in correspondent one-to-one -one correspondence to the uh, closed orbits. Or equivalently to the S equivalence classes of orbits. Where I say that two orbits here are in, are S equivalent if they're uh, closer intersects. So this is just a regular. Uh, G not GAT quotient, spec, like, yeah, naive quotient. And for any character oops, 
of the group, I can consider the GIT quotient with respect to this character, and I'll call it by mu inverse chi g. And it comes with a natural projective morphism. And I'll denote this by m chi. But because a character of the product of GLNIs is just a collection of integers, I can I'll also denote this just by m theta. So what's the difference between these two quotients? One way of thinking about it is that in this, you only separate points using invariant functions. And in this quotient, you separate points using functions that are invariant up to the action by this. Uh, or another way, so here you have an equivalence relation on orbits where you say two orbits go in the same point if their closure intersect. Here, inside u inverse of 0, you have a notion of key semi-stable points. So you're taking away some stuff. And so orbits that in here were equivalent, here they're not in equ equivalent anymore because I might have taken out stuff. So they, the closure don't intersect anymore. Um, so often, not, not always, this map psi is birational. And in some cases, and we'll see one, this will be a symplectic, uh, a smooth symplectic manifold. So holomorphic symplectic manifold. Um, so these will be symplectic resolutions. And this will be the model, the local model of these guys, of, for the uh, MH to MH0. But before. In, in order to be able to compare these things, we want to understand better what these points parameterize and what these points parameterize. So for the moduli spaces, for mh0 and mh, here we had that notion of S equivalence of, uh, vector bond, of, of sheaves that depended on the Jordan Holder filtration. So we want like an equivalent thing here that will allow us to make more explicit this, this thing. So what we do is the following. Um, following uh, King and Boudicca. So for any theta, theta 1 to S, and for any I graded vector space, we define the slope of W with respect to theta as the sum of dimension of WI times theta I over the sum of the dimension of the WI. And uh, using this, so this defines a slope, so we can define the definition if I have V a representation of some Q or Q bar, uh, that is dimension N. And I also add this condition, which is very harmful, harmless. And um, we say that this is so V is stable or semi stable if for any sub representation the slope theta of n is less or less or equal to the slope theta of V, which is zero because of this condition. But so, um, of course, the this doesn't change for which point we get here, but what changes is which sub-representations we have. Right. 
So sum of dimension of each wi times theta i over the sum of all the dimensions. Yeah. Yeah, of the character, yeah. Yeah, in fact, so if I have, let theta, theta 1 through theta s, which sum of theta i and i is equal to 0. So the mu stability, so we have the definition of stability. And so mu theta stability of a representation will correspond to the GIT stability with respect to the character of the group induced by those set of integers, as you were saying. And also the notion of S theta equivalence at the level of orbits, no, sorry, the, here on this side, we had the S equivalence of a semi-stable representation. So if V is theta semi-stable, we have the notion of jordan holder filtration of V, so then we can consider the associated graded with respect to this filtration and to representation or S theta equivalence if their associated graded pieces with respect to the Jordan hold filtration are the same. So this corresponds to the uh, equivalence relation on orbits in the locus mu inverse zero. Uh, chi theta semi-stable. So this is just a very nice way of understanding when you're doing GAT on this affine thing mu inverse of zero to understand what it means for a point to be semi-stable or for when it, what it means for two orbits to intersect. This is the analogous of when you do the quartz scheme that you put everything in the quartz scheme and then you have the group acting on the quartz scheme and you want to say that uh, a vector bundle is semi-stable if and only if the point in the quartz scheme is semi-stable with respect to an appropriate linearization. And this is exactly the same theorem, but in this case, you're just making sense of uh, the conditions, the GAT of, of these things. So for example, if I choose theta to be equal to 0, then Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, chi is just the chi theta is just the um, character. Uh, sorry, I'm yeah. I sh I should have written. Which is just a product of determinant of the gi to the theta i, if gi are the elements in the. So. For the trivial character, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if this is equal to 0, then the slope of everything is trivial. So all v in ref q bar n are stable are semi-stable. And 
stable if and only if they're simple. So simple means that they do, don't have it in the, have no non-trivial subrepresentation. So the simple guys here will correspond to the stable sheaves on the other side. And so in view of these two facts, uh, we can make sense of this map. So this I called M0. So yeah, I should have said that when you do spec of the invariants, it corresponds to GAT with respect to the trivial character. And the trivial character corresponds to this set of the sequence of integers. So this, this is why I denote this thing by M0, because this is just uh, the GIT quotient with respect to this. So here, this is a, the moduli space param parametrizing zero semi-stable representations, and I identify two zero semi-stable representation if and only if their uh, composition series are the same. So composition series, I'm just uh, defining a filtration whose success and successive quotients are simple. And, and so this thing here just corresponds to direct sum of simple representations. And if I have a representation here, I just send it to its semi-simplification. So what it means that I define a filtration on B, well, maybe this is the wrong notation, and sub-representation alpha, alpha plus 1, such that the successive quotients are simple. And so this I just associate it with it. And so it, it's the same thing as what we were doing earlier when we had MH0 that said that, say, on that, on maybe on the first stratum of the singular locus, had direct sum of, of stuff. And then we had all the possible extensions here that were stable with respect to whatever MH you're considering. And here it's exactly the same thing. So you can see that it's not very surprising in some sense that this map here should somehow correspond to this map. Um, so the last thing I want to say before, um, oh no, there are a few things. Um, so th there are a few remarks. I want to say, so first is that this map that I call psi is an isomorphism over the um, simple locus. Because over the simple locus, uh, representation just goes to itself. And I'm not identifying other stuff. And the simple locus. This side, in some sense, corresponds to the sheaf supported on integral curves on the other side. And so this is the first remark. Second remark is that m theta, the stable locus, uh, is smooth and has a symplectic form. So if the simple locus is non-empty, in particular this is non-empty, and the map is birational because it's an isomorphism over there. Yeah. 
Yes. So there are conditions. Uh, I don't think that the uh, non-emptiness of this depends neither on that. It's just like it's like a combinatorial thing uh, that Crowley Bovey wrote down. Um, I was just thinking like if you go all on the line, you have two points with no line. Mm -hmm. It seems like I can stick any vector space over on the left hand side of that line and just possibly get two vectors. Yeah, I mean, I. I can think of a simple thing that would be generated by one of the vector spaces in that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in general, it's not necessarily true that there is a simple locus, but um, it depends on, like, so each of, you can write down dimensions of these guys, and then. So what you get is for any n, so given a quiver, for any n, you write some formula, say f of n, that calculates the dimension of these guys. So whenever you write n as, say, m plus p, uh, then you're going to have some a direct sum of a simple thing with this vector plus a, a dimension thing of, with that vector. So if f of n is strictly bigger than f of m plus f of p, it means for all the possible decompositions like this, then there is a simple. Does that make sense? So basically, the things that are in the moduli space m zero n, but they're not in the product of m zero m times m zero p, are the simple things. So there's a there's a condition on non emptiness first of all of these of like of these moduli spaces. And so if this dimension is strictly bigger than that then there has to be stuff that is not. Yeah. So yeah, this was done by Crowley Bovey. And in fact, in the dictionary between quivers and sheaves, you see that there, exi there exists a simple representation if and only if there exists a stable sheaf with that Mukai vector. Um, okay, last thing I wanted to say is so these guys depend on a theta, so an element of z to the s. But in uh, the theorem of King, we have this extra condition sum of ni theta i equals to 0. We can always reduce to that case. So the set of stability parameters is a set inside z to the s of sum of n i theta i equals to 0. And so what? Uh, in the same way, Yoshioka had to compose the ample cone in the set of walls and chambers. There are an analogous condition here, and there's a wall and chamber decomposition. So, let me just draw a picture. If this is this n perp, I have zero here, and then the wall and chamber decomposition is in open convex cones. So all the chambers contain zero in its closure. That this is slightly different from the picture in the ample cone, where you had like walls not intersecting, but here, here they all. So in fact the 
I mean, the statement will be if you pick an H0 here, whatever structure of the wall and chamber decomposition here will correspond to this. We don't say anything about what happens away of these things, but just around this H0. But now I think I can write the theorem. So let H0 in M S be an ample line bundle, and F equals sum of F I and I H0 semi stable sheaf, a uh, poly stable. So I mean, I mean that F I and F J, the F I's are all stable, and F I is not equal to F J for I not equal to J. So First statement is that there exists a quiver Q with S vertices uh, such that if I set N equals to these guys here, um, then I mean this is I mean this is I put in number one, but in fact it's like basically a tautological statement. That's not just to set up notation. This is the automorphism group of this polystable sheaf. Um, and the representations of Q bar N are isomorphic G equivalently and symplectically to X1 FF. And the moment map on this side will correspond to the cup product of this side. I mean, this is something that is not an, it's almost a tautological statement. But number two is that, OK, so yeah. Um, I will, I will, I will, um, <laughs> no, I mean, okay, you're right. Uh, so, this, this is, no, no, no. What I meant was I didn't mean it's not logical, but it was not, it's not a surprise, and I think it was known earlier. Um, that's what I meant. Um, so this is a symplectic vector space with an action of this group. And this is a symplectic vector space with an action of this group. These groups are not naturally isomorphic. And there's a natural isomorphism between these two that uh, preserves the symplectic structure on the two sides and the actions on the two sides. And then, so no, the. So mu has value in GLN dual and mu x1 times x1 has value in x2 FF, which is dual to hum so, uh, FF dual. So this is just exactly that. So what this means is that, so the moment map uh, is unique up to a constant. So if you send 0 to 0, it's unique. So mu was the moment map for the, for the action of G on this side. And then I think it's a remark either of Kieran or Kaledian and Len that the cup product here is a moment map with respect to the action of G here. And so it means that under the isomorphism, the, the moment map corresponds to the cup product. There, 
uh, they're stable and they're simple if simple means that they don't have automorphisms. Or they're a C star. Is C star. That's why the automorphisms of F is equal to this. And then uh, it doesn't matter which direction you choose them to be, because then you double them. So then, so what is Q? Okay, Q. Uh, so we have the uh, S, and then you can say for I less than J, you have this many edges. Then when you go to Q bar, you double everything. So this. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I wanted to say it later, but I'll say it now. So if f, so I'm not assuming f to be pure dimension one, but if f uh, is pure dimension one, q is the dual graph of f with GI, I'll say what GI is in a moment. GI, actually, G, genus of support of FI. <coughs> yeah. With GI, support of F vertices, uh, loops at. Uh, at the vertex R at I. So, so I have a certain number of arrows in each direction that corresponds to the intersection of the support of F1 to the support of F2, because it corresponds to that. And then I'm adding the genus of the support of Fi at every vertex. This is what the quiver is if F is pure dimension one. But yes, no, it does. Um, yeah, OK, no, this interpretation like this with the dual graph is only if there's no multiplicity. Yeah. No. Um, but this statement here does not depend on f being pure of dimension one. But um, I'm already over time, but I'll finish staining. Okay. So two. If our hum F, F is formal, and I'll say what this is, is in a minute, what this means in a mi minute. It just isn't, yeah, okay, I'll say it in a mo mo moment. Then, <laughs> I'll say what it, what it means in a moment. Uh, then, M0 defined with the Q in statement one, locally at zero, is isomorphic to M H zero at F, and third statement is that if V is equal to zero, D chi. So now I restrict to pure dimension one. Then, for any chamber containing H zero in its closure. So that I have a map from H to M H zero, as we did earlier. So for any H, uh, for any chamber, there exists a chamber in the stability conditions. I erased it. It was somewhere there. 
inside ZS such that the resolution such that for any H in C and for any theta in D, the two resolutions correspond to each other. So uh, by this I mean that they're the two things are locally isomorphic here, but then like there's a whole the the the, the preimage of the isomorphism given by point two, the two preimages there are isomorphic. So do you mean if there's an explicit map? So so in some sense, what really matters for the H's and the theaters is only the, the chamber. Because on, on the chamber, the, the, you know, if you move the H or the theta in the chamber, the moduli space doesn't vary. But in fact, what you can say is that um, if you have H0 like this, then you can find, so the polarization doesn't change if you scale it, right? So you can just cut the ample cone with something transversal. And, and then you can find a linear map that sends from this slice here to this, sending H0 to 0 and every wall to a wall. And, and uh, this you really use the, the fact there are pure dimension one sheaves because it's really easy to write down walls. In general, it's hard. But for pure dimension one sheaves, you can. OK. Um, so I'm already 10 minutes over time. So I'll just say that this essentially means that the Kurenishi map is quadratic. So I don't think I can be more specific, but uh, no. So okay, it's a conjecture that it's always true, and it's. Uh, it's a conjecture of Caladian and, La and Len. And they uh, proved it for polystable sheaves that are direct sum of ideal sheaves. And then it was proved by Zhang that it's true for uh, polystable sheaves whose factors have rank greater or equal to 2. And then, so the idea, w we prove it in some cases for these pure dimension sheaf, one sheaf case. Uh, for these pure dimension one sheaves. And the idea is, we don't prove it in all cases, but is to pass from a pure dimension one sheaf, you can assume it's globally generated because you can twist and pass to the kernel of the, of the evaluation of the global section. And the deformation space of these two guys is the same. And so if you can prove that these guys are poly, like, this guy is polystable, you can use the results of Zhang to reduce it. And in an, in, with some restriction on the pick of the uh, S, we, we can show that that is true. And uh, yeah. So I think I should stop here.